The main flaw in the current monetary system is the biggest price limitation of all, the zero lower bound of interest rates. Nominal interest rates and monetary savings cannot fall below zero as this would result in people hoarding cash, which always yields zero nominal interest. What matters for the economy, however, is not the nominal interest rate, how big a percentage is actually paid on savings and charged for debt, but the real interest rate, that is the expected change in the purchasing power of held savings. Real interest is also affected by expected inflation, that is, expected future changes in the average prices of goods and services in the used currency. This is why the predictability of inflation is so important. Unexpected inflation means unexpected interest rates, and sudden price level shifts mean instant, unearned wealth transfers between debtors and creditors. But when the target inflation rate is fixed at 2%, this means that the real interest rate on monetary savings cannot fall below minus 2%, that interest rates have a lower bound. In a market economy, people essentially buy labor and risk-bearing from each other in the form of goods and services. Companies are just intermediaries arranging the production, development and delivery of the goods, etc. They won't buy labor for production or investments unless they expect to get some revenue from their customers. When there is a chronic oversupply of labor, meaning involuntary unemployment and deflationary pressures in wages and prices, that means that people want to save more than there is need for real investments. As a result, they would want to gather more monetary savings than others want to be in debt. And when there is such an overall desire to save excessively, that means that saving is too profitable, in other words, that the risk-free market interest rate is too high. And that applies even if the rate is already at or below zero. Suppose that the short-term real interest rate that was consistent with full employment had fallen to negative 2 or negative 3 percent sometime in the middle of the last decade. Then conventional macroeconomic thinking leaves us in a very serious problem. The lower bound of interest rates is like a minimum wage for capital. This is because the return on the risk-free investment option determines the profits that investors require of all other investments. They need the same return plus a risk premium to cover for the risks involved in the real investment. The cost of shareholder equity invested in a company is the opportunity cost of the lost return that could have been expected from other alternative investments. In our current monetary system, the risk-free option is having one's savings as guaranteed bank deposits. And the central bank's policy interest rate practically determines what retail banks are willing to pay their depositors. No, a market economy does not necessarily have to lead to wealth always earning more and more wealth. Surprisingly, companies can be profitable without making a profit. If just there are no unproductive safe havens like land or risk-free credit for storing one's purchasing power for the future. Such safe havens maintain higher equity costs and hence a higher income share for capital. You could tell a Marxist that the owners of the means of production might even have to pay for their right to own them. Removing capital's minimum wage and taxing land would solve, for example, Thomas Piketty's concern that wealth and income differences would keep on increasing when the economic growth rate falls below the return on capital, which he assumes to be some kind of universal constant. To facilitate negative enough real interest rates when they are needed to keep aggregate supply and demand in balance, we'd need to do one of the following. Either adopt a higher target inflation rate for the central bank, or eliminate physical cash altogether. Abandoning notes and coins starts becoming a viable option in developed economies as electronic payment services are making cash obsolete.
basically the whole austerity debate over whether the government should fiscally stimulate the economy with budget deficits or not is pointless for the most part. The only thing causing a need for such stimuli is excessive private sector austerity, excess saving, which just means that the return on saving, the risk-free interest rate, is too high. The biggest practical challenge, again, is land, location which has no price elasticity of supply. Low interest rates are often blamed for real estate bubbles, and it is true that real estate prices are sensitive to interest rates. But the root cause of this bubbling tendency is the monopoly nature of location. Without a land value tax, an expected long-term average interest rate of below minus 7% would turn real estate prices in central locations theoretically almost infinite, practically extremely speculative. Hardly anyone would be willing to sell for any price, as even a piece of real estate kept empty would be a better store of purchasing power than any productive investment. But on the other hand, the biggest political challenge in implementing a land value tax is that doing so suddenly by itself would make real estate market prices collapse. The way to make the transition with minimal unfair wealth transfers and political risks is doing both at the same time. Raising land taxation together with facilitating negative real interest rates and making other structural changes that are likely to lower the long-term return on risk-free deposits.